I am Otto Bird, and I am here to discuss with you the history and philosophy of the liberal arts. In the first lecture, we considered the nature of learning to see how the liberal arts are especially and preeminently the arts of learning. In the second lecture, we're going to look at some of the history of those arts and consider the long tradition that they have. Now the oldest and longest tradition of the liberal arts begins in Greek antiquity and continues through the Middle Ages. For the most part, that history still remains to be told. Some of its range and high points are only beginning to be explored. Notably, for example, by Gilson in his account of the transmission of classical culture, by McKeon in his study of rhetoric and dialectic, by Bohensky in his history of formal logic, and most recently by Noam Chomsky in his account of 17th century linguistics. Their work has made it clear that the study, that the story of the liberal arts is much more complicated than was once thought. As soon as we attempt to recount that history, or even start it, we run into a peculiar difficulty. It is as though we were to try telling the story of a group of characters who have lived through many centuries, but who frequently change their names and even their personalities, or at least assume such disguises that it becomes extremely difficult to identify them. In such a situation, the best way of attempting to learn their identity lies in starting with the appearance they have kept for the longest period. For the liberal arts, this is the period of the Middle Ages, say from the time of the great church fathers down to the 16th century. Even within this period, there are many changes, many differences about the arts, their nature, their number, their function. But in reading Augustine, Alcuin, John of Salisbury, Hugh of St. Victor, Roger Bacon, we find that there is a common tradition of the liberal arts which is taken for granted. As this tradition comes to assume a more or less fixed form, seven arts are distinguished as liberal and organized into two groups, the trivium and the quadrivium. Trivium, the threefold way, quadrivium, the fourfold way, indicates that the arts are means, not ends in themselves. They are ways to something else. The trivium consists of grammar, logic, rhetoric, The quadrivium, the fourfold way, consists of arithmetic, geometry, music, but we'll see this is a special meaning. Not, it's not the music, the instrumental or song music that we're used to. It's a mathematical study. And astronomy. Astronomy. Now in the next in this lecture, we're going to look at some of their history. And in the next two lectures, we'll look at these arts of the trivium. And then in the following two lectures, we'll look at the mathematical arts of the quadrivium. The identity of these arts, their nature and content, depends much on the company they keep. 
With the exception of music, however, they prove on first acquaintance to be much as we expect them to be today. Grammar consists in the understanding and skill in the use of verbal signs to accomplish the purposes of speaking, listening, and writing. Rhetoric is the art of speaking and writing effectively. Logic is the art of reasoning and disputing. Arithmetic and geometry appear as they still do on our first meeting with them as the arts of number and of magnitude. Music, however, is scarcely recognizable, which is why we'd better keep its name in quotation marks. It is predominantly mathematical and consists for the most part in the study of proportions of numbers and their properties. Astronomy is likewise predominantly mathematical and is associated with the stars through the study of the geometrical motions that they exemplify. Even in so brief and intentionally neutral a description, I have made assumptions about the liberal arts which would not always be accepted, even during the Middle Ages. However, although there may be disagreement about the individual arts and even their number, the division of the liberal arts into these two groups is undisputed. The basis of the distinction lies in the difference between linguistic and mathematical arts. The trivium, it might be said, consists of the merely verbal arts. Even when it is held that their, their truth depends on the nature of things and not on human institution, it will still be admitted that this truth is manifested and exhibited in a linguistic structure. And such a structure, as we have seen from the first le lecture, is conventional in character, agreed upon by a social group of people. The quadrivium, on the other hand, is felt to be somehow more natural, and less conventional than trivia, and its truths to be rooted in the nature of things. This difference between the two groups is described in what is the first recorded use of the name trivium. It occurs, fittingly enough, in a series of notes that some 8th or 9th century scholar made of, made of the Ars Poetica of Horace. The distinction between linguistic and mathematical arts is, of course, much earlier, as we'll see, and is supposed by Plato, for example, in his discussion of the arts in his Dialogue of the Republic. The note that uh, Horace, the note to the poem of Horace, is offered as an explanation of Horace's declared intention to teach the function and duty of writing and what trains and forms the poet. Those are Horace's words. Quid alat formetque poetam, what trains and forms the poet. According to this commentator, the difference between training and forming, between alat and format, corresponds to the difference between the trivium and the quadrivium. The poet is trained in language and all the arts necessary for their use, but he is formed by information about human actions, which belongs generally to the realm of ethics and natural things, the latter of which is the concern of the quadrivium. Hence, training precedes forming. That puts the trivium before the mathematical arts of the quadrivium. The commentator goes on to say that one can come to the knowledge of the quadrivium only through the trivium. There's still some recognition of this fact. The greatest effort in recent times is to develop an artificial language for mathematics and for logic. But it's been found that you can't begin to construct such an artificial language unless you have a natural language with which to speak in the first place. Well, that's the point this 8th or 9th century commentator was making when he said that the trivium is needed as a training before you could go on to the formative arts of, the mathematics, of mathematics and the scientists. The difference between this two group of arts is so great that different names should be used for them. Thus Cassiodorus, writing in the 6th century, holds that we should call the mathematical studies disciplines rather than arts, since discipline is concerned with those things that cannot be otherwise than they are, whereas an art is a faculty of dealing with contingent things which can be otherwise. 
This supposes, for example, that astronomy, say, deals with the actions of the planets, which are as they are, uh, to such an extent that we can forecast their future appearance, forecast the eclipses of the sun and moon, for instance, centuries in advance. Certainly at first sight, the difference would seem to be a radical one. The relations in a, sim in a simple addition, a simple sum, such as 7 plus 5 equals 12, seem to be a different kind of thing from the words just used to name the addition. The same thing can be said in many different languages, that 7 plus 5 is 12. So that the words naming it may change, whereas the numbers themselves and the relation they have in this addition remains the same. Some, as we shall see later, would deny such a distinction and conceive mathematics as only another kind of language. Yet common experience would seem to accept it readily enough, this difference. Finding a number in things, say the number of petals in a flower, seems more natural than the name we give to the fact, the name we give to the flower, the name we give to the petals. It's a property of the flower rather than an imposition, an imposition of man's linguistic ability. The number belongs to the nature of the case in a way that the name for the number does not. The name for the number can be given in different languages. In the case of the same flower, it has the same number of petals. At any rate, this difference taken as such was used to divide the liberal arts into two groups. The difference may generate a tension and develop into an outright fight. It might even be considered the classical locus of the present strife between the humanities and the sciences. This distinction within the arts, whereby the trivium can serve as a means to the quadrivium, images the greater distinction be between the arts as means and the way and the end they serve. Aristippus a Greek sophist who lived from about 435 to 350 BC is reported to have likened the arts in relation to philosophy as handmaids to Penelope. Now Penelope, you remember, is the wife of Odysseus who waited at home 20 years while Odysseus was returning from the wars. Now, if a program of arts was already established by this time, see, it would support the contention of some historians that the liberal arts owe their inception to the work of the sophists. Nor is this unlikely, since the sophists, in offering to teach wisdom, could be expected to formulate a program of studies leading to it. However, as we know from Plato's battle with the sophists, over the nature of wisdom, the love of wisdom, which is philosophy, may arouse conflicting views. Before an issue of such scope, it may be asked whether the liberal arts remain unaffected, if it is their function to prepare for knowledge and philosophy, and there are differences about the best knowledge, the best philosophy. On this issue, whether the arts are affected or not, there is a strong reply in the negative. It is given by Cicero, who figures largely in any story of the liberal arts, both because of his own contributions to them in his study of eloquence and because of his decisive influence on the fathers of the church, most responsible for the elaboration of the arts program in the Middle Ages. Now Cicero, the great, the great uh, orator, writer, and politician, seeks an explanation of the bad times into which eloquence, learning, and statesmanship had fallen in his day. Now he attributes that fall to the corruption of philosophy and as evidence provides a short history of philosophy. For him, as for many others, the golden age of philosophy lies in the past. He's writing in the first century BC, you know. There was a time, he tells us, 
when wisdom meant the union of thought and word, and philosophy, which is the love of wisdom, was a unity in knowledge and action of the best things, a union in both knowledge and action. See? His examples of such wisdom are men who, even in Cicero's day, were already ancient, such legendary figures as Lycurgus and Solon, founders of, of, uh, of Rome, of Sparta, and of Athens, uh, two of the sages of antiquity. Nero to Cicero's own day, Pericles, the great fifth century Greek leader, is cited. If Cicero should choose, could choose, from our time, a man such as Churchill would certainly also qualify for his union of, of action and knowledge. Of course, we would not call Churchill a philosopher, but this only proves Cicero's point, which is that he once would have been a philosopher, that he should be a philosopher, and if he is not now, or was in Cicero's time, this only shows that something has happened to philosophy. What has happened, according to Cicero, to Cicero is a divorce between tongue and heart, words and thought, between speaking well and acting rightly. Specialization began to develop as men turned away from public affairs to devote themselves, Cicero says, more than was necessary to poetry, geometry, music, even worse, to dialectic. Uh, they became specialists, you see. But worst of all, men turned their backs upon duties of state and attacked and condemned the power of speech in civil affairs and snatched to themselves for their own pursuits the noble name of philosopher, thereby destroying the name which until then had been common to judging wisely and speaking eloquently. Cicero's words. The culprit, according to Cicero, though this is hard for us to believe, who have learned a very different history of philosophy, the one person most to blame for the divorce of knowledge and action of uh, words and knowledge was Socrates. From him, Cicero traces the entire development of philosophy and science as pursuits of the, of the mind divorced from political eloquence and political action. Scientific specialization and neglect of politics go hand in hand for Cicero, and in condemning both, Cicero sounds like some contemporary politicians and educators, but he condemns them in the name of philosophy as well as of politics, condemning the separation of these two, of uh, thought and action. Cicero obviously has one definite purpose for the arts, and indeed for all knowledge that of serving the political wisdom of the statesman. It is equally clear that one of the liberal arts becomes predominant over the others as serving to order the rest to their end and enabling them to achieve it. Cicero himself represents that art at its highest. It's the art of rhetoric or eloquence. Cicero may claim that the arts must be ordered to philosophy as their end, Yet it is his conception of philosophy that de determines the kind of order he obtains. He even admits explicitly that he is interested not in the philosophy that is truest, but in that which best accords with the function of the orator and statesman. Needless to say, this is not the only possible conception of philosophy. Another view of philosophy and knowledge, one, for example, that aims at truth about reality rather than political action, would tell a very different story about the development of the arts. The objects of Cicero's criticism have a strong case to be made on their side. Yet Cicero's history still provides a type for any history of the liberal arts. It shows, first, that the liberal arts can be conceived as a means to an end. Any change in the end will be reflected in the structure of the arts as means. Any change in the means may affect the achievement of the end. Such changes give rise to different cons constructions of the arts individually and as a whole group. Such changes give rise 
to different constructions of the arts according to different conceptions of their nature and function. Among the arts themselves, this may appear in the, in the prominence given to one over another and the establishment of different hierarchies of the arts, just as uh, Cicero puts rhetoric at the top of all the arts. In this way, the history of the liberal arts becomes the narrative of the changes which the arts undergo in themselves and in their relation to one another, to each other and to their end as means. Viewed as a battle, as it sometimes is, it is the story of the shifts of the various arts to favored positions in the hierarchy as they are ordered to different ends or as they, as they are used in different ways for the same end. The change wrought by a shift in their end is apparent in the medieval tradition of the arts. By this time, there had long existed under the Christian dispensation. Their incorporation into it is already full achieved, at least theoretically, in the work of St. Augustine. In being integrated with Christianity as a means to wisdom, they became ordered to a radically different end from any they had before. For with St. Paul, wisdom is identified with Christ himself. The arts, as ordered to such a wisdom, are consequently subordinated to the truth of faith, since Christ is known as God, and hence his wisdom only through faith. The repository of faith is primarily the revelation of God as contained in the sacred scriptures and the tradition of the church. On such a view of wisdom, the work of the liberal arts becomes one of interpreting the sacred text and its tradition with the end of knowing and loving God and carrying out his will in the world. Throughout the Middle Ages, theology reigns supreme as the end to which the liberal arts are ordered as means. We have what might be called, after the title of a work by St. Bonaventure, the reduction of the arts to theology. Yet it would be a mistake to suppose from this that they cease to have a history. Although the end may remain fixed, at least in theory, to serve theology and the faith, the arts are still at work in differing and changing ways to achieve that end. And their relation to each other does not always remain the same. In fact, a struggle ensues which comes to be described explicitly as a battle, the battle of the arts. Some of the more apparent shifts within the liberal arts appear very early. Thus, according as the task of the arts is conceived as predominantly that of interpreting the sacred text and make it known, then grammar and rhetoric, see, assume the leading position and the other arts are subordinated to their use. This is fully illustrated in St. Augustine's work on Christian doctrine, which may be viewed as a reorganization of the Ciceronian program to achieve the Christian teacher rather than the secular statesman. However, the truths of faith may also be taken as an object of rational analysis and of a dialectical movement to bring about the ascent of the mind to God. This tendency also finds expression in the work of St. Augustine, and especially in such an early work as the De Ordine on order. After him, although the same general end is pursued, there is a tendency to follow one of these directions exclusively. Thus, in the Carolingian Renaissance, Alcuin in the 8th century follows the way of grammar and approximates the classical program of Cicero, but is ordered now to Christian wisdom. Whereas Origina, also in the 9th century in Gaul, follows the way of dialectic and stressing the mathematical arts of the quadrivium as a means of ascent, tends to approximate a philosophical program such as outlined by Plato. Although mathematics is the least developed of the arts during the Middle Ages, there are cases where the quadrivian seems to be given predominance. Thierry of Chartres, for example, in the 12th century, claims that all rational explanation depends upon number. The fight between the trivium and the quadrivium, and between the arts within the trivium particularly, became most violent in the 12th, and mo changing most, in the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe because in the 12th and 13th centuries saw the re-entry into Europe 
of the entire corpus of the works of Aristotle. See, all of Greek science was available for the first time in centuries to the West. This rediscovery of Greek science and philosophy, extending to every aspect of human natural realms, exhibited a fully constituted natural wisdom. At a time, it appeared to some that this natural wisdom could only be a rival to the Christian wisdom that had been reigning supreme for centuries. To others, it appeared as something that could and should be incorporated within within the faith and theology. At any rate, there was all the appearance of a tension and a strife between science and religion. From another point of view, however, this strife is another aspect of the battle of the liberal arts, and it is described as such in a, a French poem of the 13th century, entitled in French, The Battle of the Arts, The Battle of the Seven Arts. Although all seven arts are engaged, the battle is primarily between logic and grammar, each with its own army. It is significant, however, that logic has all the seven arts on its side. Since the, the ranks of logic includes a perverse grammar, described by the poet as lined up against good antiquity. This is sufficient to show that logic has already carried the day at least in the schools. The rationally organized new science of Aristotle appears now under the aegis of logic, and grammar, instead of studying the language of the poets, had become a philosophical inquiry into the nature of language and the modes of signifying. It's something like the recent developments in, uh, in linguistics, and the rediscovery of the idea of a universal grammar. Logic had won the students and gained such a vogue that every boy has gone through her course before he has reached his 15th year. That means the students at the universities were taking to logic and opposing the study of grammar with the study of poetry and literature. Opposed to logic is the true grammar, the poet says, in whose ranks are the old Latin grammarians and the poets from Homer and Virgil down to 12th century poets, such as Alan of Lille and Bernard Silvestre. Theology, or divinity, my lady, the high science, as she's called, is pictured as not taking part in the battle, since she has no care about the dispute. Yet she is described, theology is described, as foolishly holding disputations in the schools, abandoning the old tradition, and trumpeting philosophy. Already we foresee the triumph of scholasticism and its greatest moment, monuments, the Summa Theologiae, in which the whole of theology receives a scientific and logical organization. Logic and her cohorts with Plato, Aristotle, Don Socrates carry everything before them. Yet the poet, whose sympathies are entirely with the defeated, with the ranks of grammar and her poets, is not without hope. He prophesies that not 30 years will pass away before a new race will arise and return again to grammar, as it was when he was born, says the poet. He was not such a bad prophet, that poet, since the generation he awaited was to be more not 30, but some 70, 70 years later, when in the class of a modest grammarian of Carpentras in southern France, a small, a small nine-year-old boy named Petrarch would hear for the first time the music of Cicero. So if grammar was defeated, its day is not to die, but only to retire, to gather up her forces, to do battle again, and this time to triumph under the Ciceronianism and Augustinianism of Petrarch and the Renaissance. The Renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries is certainly much too complicated to be summed up in a few sentences. And yet there is much to be said for the poet's prophecy that it was to be a triumph of grammar, at least if viewed as a part of the history of the liberal arts. On its literary side, in the Renaissance, we find an intense cultivation of the classical languages and a truly tremendous work of editing 
and commenting on texts, uh, the texts of antiquity, classical antiquity, all of which belong primarily to the work of grammar. Great erudition is accumulated and expended for the most part on the elucidation of a text. Although Cicero is hailed as its master and theorist, it is quite un-Ciceronian in, in its predominantly literary and scholarly character, since for all uh, his, his literary turn and delight in verbal beauty, Cicero never forgets the problem of state, the work of the statesman. The literary humanists of the Renaissance see, were not statesmen. The poet also foresaw in his Battle of the Seven Arts uh, that he, and the side he represented in the arts, was profoundly and violently opposed to logic. The scholastic achievement, one, in the, one of the greatest in the whole history of logic, is dismissed as useless, and logic becomes a matter of no importance and no concern to grammar and, and her cohorts. Bohensky, in telling the history of formal logic, finds that the Renaissance is a dark age for logic, and some of its greatest lights knew less logic than boys at the age of 15 did in the Middle Ages. However, this predominantly literary side of the Renaissance, which is anti-logical, is also anti-scientific. There is also a scientific side in the Renaissance, and viewed from this aspect, it gives a new prominence to the arts of the, of the quadrivium. See, since modern science arises in the Renaissance, and with the rise of, of modern science, we also see that the quadrivium the mathematical arts of the quadrivium appear again and come, in fact, to prominence. The triumph of the mathematical arts appears most manifestly, of course, in the conquest of science and the industrialization of the world that has happened since the 17th century. It might, be, it might even be claimed that the atom, the atom bomb is the latest achievement of the quadrivium. It seems strange to speak of science and the atom bomb as works of liberal art. It's not at all unusual to oppose the sciences to the liberal arts, and educators often talk of the need of making the sciences more liberal. If the liberal arts are present, they must be well disguised, and so they are. As we come into the times called modern, the arts frequently go unrecognized. This is particularly true of science with its strongly technological side. Technology as engineering is primarily a mechanical, not a liberal art, and yet the technology is possible only because of the knowledge upon which it rests, and this is especially in mathematics and physics, and these are works of liberal art. Yet if we look back to the founders of modern science, we find that they con constantly considered science a work of liberal art. Perhaps they did so because they were more conscious than we are of the tradition of the liberal arts. In a justly famous passage in uh, Il Saggiatore, the wise man, Galileo writes, science is written in that great book which is always open before our eyes. I mean the universe, but it cannot be understood if one does not understand the language and know the characters in which it is written. It is written in the language of mathematics. Its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. Remember that at the time of Galileo, geometry was the supreme mathematical science. We'll see more about that a little later on. Without knowledge of these, these mathematical arts, we cannot understand the speech of nature and can but wander vainly through an obscure labyrinth. In this passage, Galileo is giving expression to what was common doctrine among Renaissance scientists and artists too. We need only recall Leonardo da Vinci, Piero della Francesca, and Dürer, Albert Dürer. The passage could still be used as a description of contemporary science, although few scientists would think of doing so. Yet, the comparison it employs possesses the advantage of making clear the function of liberal art in science, since to compare science to reading a book 
expounds it in the more familiar terms of the linguistic arts. Galileo is saying, in effect, nature has a story to tell. And once we know the story, we have a scientific understanding of nature. But we cannot read or even hear the story until we know the language in which it is written. In other words, we need a symbolic discipline which will provide us with the facility to grasp and interpret the signs and symbols with which the story is told. As a symbolic discipline used for the purpose of knowledge, it is a liberal art that is needed. The distinction between the book, or rather its story, and the language in which it is written corresponds to the difference between science and liberal art. Or still more generally, to the difference between the end and the means for achieving it, which are the liberal arts. Galileo identifies the language of nature with uh, mathematics, in particular with geometry. A modern physics would substitute the calculus and differential equations and higher geometries for the old geometry. And this substitution affords an indication of a shift among the arts of the, quiver, the quadrivium in which geometry has yielded its place of supremacy to another. Of more immediate interest, however, is the question of the relation between mathematics and the natural world. We've already looked at the earlier contention that this is much more intimate relation than that between the trivium and nature. Galileo again affirms that the symbolic means for knowing the natural world are a different kind from those of our ordinary discourse. He continues with the tradition in affirming that there is a basic distinction between the arts of the trivium and those of the quadrivium. To appreciate his analogy, we would say that man in his intellectual endeavor has two different kinds of books to read. The book written by, by men and by women, and the book written by nature. Both books tell primarily of things other than themselves. They talk about men, the world, and God. Mathematical arts, in the first creative advance of their modern development, receive little or no help from the ancient arts of language, the trivium. There were many reasons for this. In part, it was a continuation of the ancient view of the utter diversity uh, between the trivium and the quadrivium. In part also, the ancient linguistic and logical tradition did not appear relevant. Much of it was not generally known, and what passed for it was so degraded that a man like Descartes, a very great philosopher and scientist, could dismiss the past logic and linguistic arts as useless for the purpose of the sciences. At any rate, the new developments in mathematics and science that began in the 16th century seemed to take place pretty much on their own without any influence from the old arts of the trivium. The result was a split and a divorce between two kinds of arts which at least in theory had always been joined. So much then for the history. What can it tell us but about the nature of the liberal arts themselves? Well, in the first place, that they are arts, certain kinds of arts. Hence, we need to consider the nature of art and its kinds if we are to be able to place at all accurately the nature of the liberal arts. Now, for the understanding of art and its kinds, the basic and essential distinctions are given by Aristotle. The first of these occurs in the sixth book of his Nicomachean Ethics, where he is concerned to identify and distinguish the intellectual virtues, as he called them. That is, what he means by a virtue, the dispositions or habits by which the mind is developed to carry out well its various functions. The virtue of a faculty or a power is relative to the work or function that that power performs. Aristotle, accordingly, distinguishes three activities of intellect, each of which performs a different function. And these three activities, each performing a different function, are knowing, doing, and making. Knowing is distinct from the other two, is, concern, is concerned with that which is, which is not, either our doing or making. It is knowing for the sake of knowing. The qualities of habits that enable this activity to be good and excellent 
are the speculative virtues of understanding or insight. Now, there are three of them. Understanding or insight. Aristotle's Greek is nous, N-O-U-S. Speculating or, speculative or philosophical wisdom, Sophia. And scientific knowledge, episteme, which, which our word epi epistemology comes. Although knowledge, is episteme in Aristotle's sense, is not to be equated with our empirical science. Episteme for Aristotle, his science is more relative to our concern than the other two virtues here, and he defines it as an apodictic habit. Apodictic habit. That is, the ability to demonstrate a conclusion from prior or better known principles. Principles which Aristotle would claim must be certain and necessary. So you see, what he's calling science, episteme, is essentially uh, rational demonstration. Doing, praxis in the Greek, making, poiesis, from which our word poetry comes, both differ from speculative or theor theoretical knowing in that they both aim at something more than the knowing itself that is involved. Making is concerned with the thing to be made. Doing is concerned with the action to be done. Praxis, doing, is the realm of moral and political action, of human behavior, which may be uh, good or evil. Its specific virtue is prudence, which is defined as a practical habit with true reason concerning the goods and evils of human beings. Praxis, doing, with uh, its virtue of prudence, or phronesis. Now, poesis, see, making, from which our word poetry comes, is the activity of making something or producing or performing it. It aims at something more than either the knowing or the action that is involved with it. Its specific virtue is art, techni in Aristotle's Greek, from which our word technology is derived. It is defined, uh, poesis, is defined as a, pro, as a productive habit. Now productive here is a translation of poetike, see, it's a making habit. A uh, productive habit with true reason. And about it Aristotle notes, all art is concerned with coming into being, that is, with contriving and considering how something may come into being which is capable of either being or not being, and whose origin is in the maker, not in the thing made. For art is concerned neither with things that are or come into being by necessity, nor with things that do so in accordance with nature, since these have their origin in themselves. So we're talking about art, you see, Aristotle's notion of uh, art as making. Before considering more closely this definition, see, remember what it was uh, of art, a productive habit with true reason. Now we ought to note and emphasize how broad this notion of art is, and yet also how distinct. First, art is a disposition or quality of the mind, the excellence of the intellectual activity of making. It is distinct and different from science and prudence, which are the virtues of knowing and doing, respectively. In that, apart from the exercise of the art, the work would not exist at all. Its end, in the work it aims to produce, is external to the activity in the art. Whether it is a heart, or whether it is a house, a hat, a pot, a chair, a lyric, a symphony, a tragic drama, a dance, an automobile, an airplane, a satellite, a computer, whatever it is, as long as it is a man-made object existing external to the maker. Turning back then to our definition, we can note where clarification is called for. As a productive habit with true reason, that's the definition of art now, of, of making poesis, the note that it is productive, poetike, restricts it to making in the makeable. That it is a habit 
indicates that it is a disposition or quality of mind by which one has developed an ability that others may not have. Thus a carpenter has, possesses, an ability so perfected that he can saw, plane, nail, put wood together in a way, or a better way, than one who lacks the skill. That being the art that he has. Why then does Aristotle add true reason, a productive habit with true reason? This qualification indicates two things. First, that an art involves knowledge as reason, and second, that it is one that may fail of its purpose. So an artisan who lacks the skill may fail to saw a straight cut or plane a fine surface, just as a beginner may cook a souffle that falls and tastes bad. The possession of the skill can be seen in the goodness or badness of the product. Hence, the adage that art does not fail, it's the failure that lies in the maker who fails to possess it. See, the art itself can't fail, Aristotle says. Perhaps a clearer, although equally literal, translation of the definition is the, that art is having the right know-how of things makeable. To include the reference to knowledge and the true, or right, serves to emphasize the, that art is an intellectual activity, however much it may call also for muscular adaptations and training, such as those needed for playing a musical instrument or sawing a board. The difference between the work that is made and the knowing that contributes to its making also emphasizes an important point. The work made, whether at a kitchen pot, an automobile, a dramatic or musical production, is in each case a concrete, material, individual thing, regardless of how many times it may be reproduced. However, the knowing involved in art is not individual or singular, but universal. The house builder's art is capable of producing not just one house, but many, many houses. The, th the thing made, the artwork, may be singular and contingent, and in some cases destined to endure for only a short while, as does a dance. But the knowledge in the art as skill contains rules and methods capable of being applied again and again to many diverse singular works. To narrow in upon the notion of liberal art, we need still a further distinction. Aristotle also provides it in his politics in the eighth book where he discusses education. For there he notes that one must distinguish between two different sorts of arts according as they are liberal or illiberal. He makes this distinction according to the kinds of activity that befit a free man, a free man or a slave. But this a sociological basis for the way he expresses it should not be allowed to conceal its ontological basis. Aristotle's language may betray the contingencies of the society in which he lived and wrote, but there is an ontological basis to the distinction that far transcends the sociological contingency of his expression. Aristotle makes this distinction lar largely in negative terms by pointing out what is illiberal. Such is identified as any occupation, art, or science which makes the body, soul, or mind of the free man less fit for the practice or exercise of virtue. But for Aristotle, the highest activities of virtue for the free man consist in fulfilling the duties of civic life or the pursuit of philosophical wisdom. Both of these require the freedom of leisure and the unhampered exercise of the intellect or mind in deliberation and speculation. Hence, the great obstacle to both is any activity or occupation that dulls the mind and prevents its full and free operation. And of these, the heaviest lies in the concerns of the body tying down one, tying one down to the needs of the singular here and now. Hence, Aristotle's demand is much like the old religious sanction that forbade menial work on the Sabbath. In both instances, the need is for freedom of the mind. Thank <laughs> you.